In this next section, we will be discussing a number of causes of non-bloody diarrhea, often also referred to as watery diarrhea. The first point to remember here is that any of the pathogens we've already discussed as causes of bloody diarrhea can potentially cause non-bloody or watery diarrhea as well. So in other words, just because a patient does not have blood in their stool does not mean that they can't have salmonella or campylobacter, etc. It's also important to recognize that the majority of cases of acute infectious non-bloody diarrhea are self-limited, meaning that they'll resolve on their own typically don't require any workup and need only supportive care like hydration. In fact, the majority of these cases are viral infections that of course will not respond to antimicrobials. There are times, however, in which we should consider workup for non-bloody diarrhea with stool tests similar to how we approach those with bloody diarrhea. Indications for workup include severe illness, which can be profuse diarrhea or dehydration, severe abdominal pain, hospitalization, or greater than six stools per day. Also signs of inflammatory diarrhea such as bloody or mucousy stools greater than one week of duration, or individuals that are high risk for serious illness, such as those greater than the age of 70, or others with serious chronic health conditions. In our first case, we see a 24-year-old male who develops watery diarrhea shortly after a trip to Mexico three days ago. While he was there, he tried to drink bottled water, but he did purchase a drink from a street vendor and drank it. As well as watery diarrhea, he's having associated nausea with vomiting, abdominal cramping, and bloating. He also has a slight fever. His symptoms resolve within five days. This is a classic case of traveler's diarrhea caused by enterotoxigenic E. coli. Patients with enterotoxigenic E. coli often have symptoms of malaise and anorexia with associated abdominal cramps and watery diarrhea. They may have nausea and vomiting as well as occasionally fever. Onset typically occurs 16 hours or more, usually about three to five days after exposure, with symptoms typically resolving on their own within about one to five days. It's spread through the fecal oral route, often through contaminated water or possibly food. It's considered to be the most common cause of traveler's diarrhea occurring with travel to Mexico, Asia, Africa, and South and Central America. For enterotoxigenic E. coli, the key virulence factors are the heat labile and heat stable toxins. The heat labile toxin increases cyclic AMP, whereas the heat stable toxin increases cyclic GMP. The end result is decreased sodium reabsorption and increased chloride secretion, and to a degree increased bicarbonate secretion. This effectively creates salt in the lumen, which causes an osmotic pull of water and watery diarrhea. Remember, the heat labile toxin is also seen in Bacillus cirrus, Vibrio cholera, and Campylobacter jejuni. Many of the cases of traveler's diarrhea occur from E. coli, enterotoxigenic E. coli being the classic example, but entoaggregate of E. coli also being a potential cause. Many of the other pathogens that we've discussed and will discuss also can cause traveler's diarrhea. These include Campylobacter, Salmonella, Shigella, viruses, Giardia, Cryptosporidium, and Entamoeba histolytica. So do we consider prophylactic antibiotics in patients that are planning to travel to resource limited areas and want to avoid traveler's diarrhea? The majority of cases, the answer is no. However, there may be patients that are at high risk for severe illness from traveler's diarrhea, such as those with inflammatory bowel disease, immunocompromised patients such as those with HIV, or patients with other high risk conditions that would make it extra dangerous if they became dehydrated. In these cases, it's appropriate to prescribe prophylactic antibiotics, and the antibiotic of choice for this is Rifaximin. Now, when considering the workup and treatment, as we discussed earlier, most cases of non-bloody diarrhea are self-limited and do not require any workup and only need supportive care. This holds true for most cases of traveler's diarrhea as well. However, you remember that we discussed there are indications for workup, such as severe or prolonged illness or bloody diarrhea. Ultimately, if a patient does have severe symptoms and needs antibiotic treatment, azithromycin is typically considered the first choice. Now let's turn our attention to the rifamycin group of antibiotics. This would include rifampin, also known as rifampicin, rifapentine, rifamycin, rifabutin, and for the purposes of this lecture, oral rifaximin for the treatment of traveler's diarrhea. Rifaximin is effective against select aerobic gram-negative bacteria. The mechanism of action of rifaximin is to inhibit bacterial DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. 
By inhibiting interaction with DNA, this drug blocks transcription of messenger RNA, ultimately inhibiting protein synthesis. Shown here is the structure of rifaximin. As a treatment for traveler's diarrhea, this drug inhibits mRNA synthesis. Rifaximin is used prophylactically to treat certain types of infection with E. coli. These drugs are used in adults and children at least 12 years of age. This drug will not treat traveler's diarrhea that is bloody or occurs with fever. Because this drug is not effectively absorbed into enteropathic circulation due to the fact that it is a good CYP3A4 and P-glycoprotein substrate, this drug is therefore useful for treatment of bacterial infection inside the colon. This pharmacokinetic property of rifaximin is different when compared with rifampicin. Rifampicin does enter enterohepatic circulation, whereas rifaximin does not. Hence, rifampicin is used for bacterial meningitis, whereas rifaximin is restricted for use in infections inside the colon. Next, we have a 12-month-old male with diarrhea and dehydration. You see this patient while on a medical mission trip to Africa. The patient is having profuse, watery diarrhea with signs of dehydration, including sunken eyes and poor skin turgor. He, however, is afebrile. This is a case of enteropathogenic E. coli leading to severe dehydration. Enteropathogenic E. coli can lead to severe watery diarrhea and can be recurrent. There may be associated nausea and vomiting, but fever occurs less commonly. Importantly, it can lead to life-threatening dehydration. One of the signs of dehydration is decreased or poor skin turgor, meaning that when you pinch the skin, it does not quickly return to its normal flat state. Enteropathogenic E. coli is spread through fecal-oral transmission, commonly from poor sanitary conditions. You will typically see this in infants and young children, commonly in resource-limited areas such as sub-Saharan Africa. The main virulence factor that enteropathogenic E. coli has is the ability to form colonies on the enterocyte surface by a plasmid-encoded bundle-forming pili. After adherence, the enteropathogenic E. coli efface and destroy the microvilli structures of the enterocytes, resulting in diarrhea and malabsorption. Note that this pathogenic mechanism is not unique to enteropathogenic E. coli, as other subtypes of E. coli can have this virulence factor, but it is the main virulence factor that allows enteropathogenic E. coli to cause disease. I want to take a moment and summarize the pathogenic E. coli that we've covered. Here on the left is just a reminder that E. coli is lactose fermenting positive as opposed to some of the other pathogens we've talked about. Remember, it's a gram negative rod. On the right, we have outlined the different strains of E. coli. Remember the top two, enterotoxigenic E. coli, enteropathogenic E. coli, are both watery or non-bloody diarrhea. Enterotoxigenic E. coli typically being traveler's diarrhea. Enteropathogenic is typically infantile diarrhea, so affecting young infants often in resource-limited areas and can cause serious dehydration. These next two, remember enterohemorrhagic E. coli, enteroinvasive E. coli, both can be potentially bloody diarrhea. Enterohemorrhagic with, with the potential for causing hemolytic uremic syndrome when it's associated with the shigalike toxin. Enteroinvasive E. coli is very similar to shigella and can cause a dysentery with typically fever and bloody diarrhea. So when you see E. coli causing bloody diarrhea with fever, think enteroinvasive E. coli. Enteroaggregative E. coli, again, we haven't covered a whole lot, but can cause traveler's diarrhea and can cause persistent diarrhea in children and in patients with HIV. Next, we have a 35-year-old female with watery diarrhea. This occurs as part of an outbreak of diarrheal illness in Haiti that occurs several months after a massive earthquake. The stool is not only watery, but also has flecks of mucus in it, often referred to as rice water stools. The patient has associated vomiting, but no fever. Multiple household members also have the same illness. This is an example of an actual outbreak of Vibrio cholera that occurred in Haiti after the catastrophic earthquake of 2010. Vibrio cholera causes the diarrheal illness that is referred to as cholera. Cholera is often characterized by flecks of mucus in the stool, referred to as rice water stools, as demonstrated here. Vomiting commonly occurs, but fever is uncommon. When severe, cholera can have profuse diarrhea that can lead to life-threatening dehydration, for which rehydration is critical.
In the upper right picture here, you can see some cots used to monitor and treat patients with cholera. In the bottom left is a patient suffering from dehydration from cholera. Note her sunken eyes. In the bottom right, the same patient appears significantly improved after life-saving rehydration. Like many of the bacterial causes of diarrhea, cholera is spread through fecal-oral transmission, through contaminated food and water. We can see cholera occur regularly in areas where it's endemic or regularly present, typically related to poor sanitation, but it can also occur as outbreaks or epidemics. Outbreaks and epidemics can occur when natural disasters strike or human conflicts such as war decrease access to safe water, as we saw in our case in Haiti. Areas affected by cholera include Africa, Asia, the Middle East, South and Central America, and the Caribbean. In the United States, you may occasionally see cholera in sporadic cases when patients have eaten raw shellfish such as oyster, similar to Vibrio parahemolyticus that we saw previously. You may also see this in individuals that have traveled to an affected area. As stated before, Vibrio cholera, like Vibrio parahemolyticus, is a gram-negative curved or comma-shaped bacteria. And like Vibrio parahemolyticus, it has a single polar flagellum, which makes it motile in water. Here we see a gram stain of Vibrio cholera. The bacteria are pink, indicating their gram negativity, and several of them show characteristic curvature. By now you should know this toxin mechanism, as it is the same for Enterotoxigenic E. coli, Bacillus cirrus, Vibrio cholera, this bacteria, and Campylobacter jejuni. The active subunit of the heat labile AB toxin leads to increased cyclic AMP, ultimately leading to increased salt in the lumen and voluminous diarrhea. The potential large volume loss in cholera comes from the small intestines. Now, when approaching a patient with possible cholera, it's critical to recognize signs and symptoms of dehydration. These can include increased thirst, decreased urine output, lethargy, poor skin turgor, as we previously discussed, delayed capillary refill with normal being less than two seconds, sunken eyes, dry skin, especially dry axilla, dry mucous membranes, and increased heart rate and low blood pressure. Remember that dehydration is a reason to pursue workup in non-bloody diarrhea, including stool studies. Hopefully you also remember from previous lectures in the past that when evaluating a patient with dehydration, you should also check a basic metabolic panel to evaluate the electrolytes and renal function. In the management of cholera, rehydration should be your primary focus and often will require IV fluids. After rehydration, you can consider antibiotic treatment for cholera with choices being doxycycline, azithromycin, and ciprofloxacin. One of the keys in managing outbreaks of cholera is administration of available oral vaccine. Doxycycline is a 30S bacterial ribosome inhibitor. It's a member of the tetracycline family of antibiotics. Ultimately, all of these drugs listed here inhibit protein synthesis. The structure of doxycycline is shown here. This drug is used in the treatment of infections caused by bacteria and certain parasites to include bacterial pneumonia, acne, chlamydia infections, Lyme disease. For the purposes of this lecture, we're talking about cholera, but it can also be used to treat typhus, syphilis, and it's used prophylactically to prevent malaria when used in combination with quinine. It's available in both oral or IV formulations. Some common side effects of doxycycline include diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Interestingly, there's an increased risk of sunburn associated with doxycycline use. And importantly, this drug is less likely to cause C. diff colitis. Doxycycline is a category class D drug. There is positive evidence of human fetal risk based on adverse reaction data from investigational or marketing experience or studies actually performed in humans. However, potential benefits may warrant the use of the drug in pregnant women despite the potential risks. This drug crosses into breast milk, and for that reason, the family of tetracycline antibiotics are contraindicated in pregnancy and in children up to eight years of age due to the potential for disrupting bone and tooth development. We will now turn to some viral causes of non-bloody diarrhea. 
While we will only be covering two viruses, there are a number of other viruses that can cause gastroenteritis, a term often used to refer to infectious nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Indeed, the majority of cases of acute infectious gastroenteritis are caused by viruses. Here we have an eight-month-old male with watery diarrhea. His past history includes the fact that he's not had any vaccines. He is having associated vomiting and fever with his diarrhea. His three-year-old brother has a similar illness. Also note that this is occurring during the winter. Overall, his symptoms resolve within one week. This is an example of gastroenteritis caused by rotavirus. Rotavirus is an RNA virus. It leads to watery diarrhea that can have associated vomiting and fever. Similar to enteropathogenic E. coli and cholera, this can lead to severe dehydration. The incubation period is typically about 48 hours with duration lasting about one week. It's spread through fecal-oral transmission and it is common to have household contacts also infected. Rotavirus is becoming less common due to the fact that there's now an oral vaccine that's available. Typically this affects infants, usually under the age of two, and should especially be considered in infants that are unvaccinated. Note also that it tends to occur more seasonally during the winter months. Next, we have a 60-year-old male who presents with watery diarrhea after returning yesterday from a cruise. He's having vomiting, fever, and abdominal cramps, but his symptoms resolve within three days. This is a case of viral gastroenteritis caused by norovirus, also known as Norwalk virus. Norovirus is also an RNA virus. Again, viruses are the most common causes of acute gastroenteritis, and norovirus tops the list as the most common. Other causes of viral gastroenteritis include adenoviruses and astroviruses. With norovirus, patients typically have watery diarrhea and vomiting, fever, and abdominal pain. It often occurs abruptly with an incubation period of only one to two days, and the duration is typically brief, often only lasting about three days and is self-limited. It's spread through fecal-oral transmission and is very contagious, contributing to it being so common. It tends to affect older children and adults and can occur in outbreaks in nursing homes, schools, and cruise ships. The last two cases we will be covering are both parasites, specifically protozoa. First, we have a 21-year-old female who presents with greasy diarrhea. She returned from a backpacking trip about two weeks ago, and she noted that her stools are now loose, smell foul, and seem greasy. She's having associated malaise and nausea with abdominal cramps and flatulence. This is a case of Giardia lamblia. Giardia characteristically causes non-bloody, fatty, or greasy diarrhea. The term we use to refer to this fatty diarrhea is steatorrhea. Patients often have associated abdominal bloating and flatulence. This tends to occur over a little bit longer period of a time with the incubation period about seven to 14 days and overall lasting one to four weeks. Importantly, it can become chronic, though some patients actually are asymptomatic. You should think of Giardia as a cause of persistent or chronic diarrhea, especially if the stools are greasy. Classically, Giardia is spread by drinking unfiltered lake or stream water, often when patients are hiking or camping. Like non-typhoidal Salmonella, Yersinia, and Campylobacter that we previously covered, Giardia is considered zoonotic, meaning that it can spread from animal reservoirs, in this case beavers, cattle, dogs, rodents, and bighorn sheep. It can also spread person to person, such as might occur in daycares. Giardia can also occur worldwide in resource limited areas, and in fact is one of the most common causes of diarrhea in children less than five years old worldwide. Giardia lamblia is a motile protozoan parasite with numerous flagella, which allows it to move in the water. It is the most common parasitic pathogen in humans and is transmitted by its cyst form in fecally contaminated food or water. The cyst form is resistant to degradation, including being resistant to water treatment methods, such as chlorination, while the trophozoite form rapidly degrades outside the body. The parasite replicates in the small intestine where it causes microvillus damage without invasion and an increased intraepithelial lymphocytic response as secretory IgA is important for its removal, immunosuppressed IgA deficient individuals can be significantly affected. Here we see two pear-shaped Giardia parasites in this histologic biopsy in the small bowel next to larger enterocytes. 
And here we see the classic binucleated form of the trophozoite on a right stain and the cyst form on an iodine stain. Both of these forms can be seen in a stool sample. In our last case, we have a four-year-old female with watery diarrhea that started 10 days after swimming in a public pool. Her diarrhea is profuse and she has a low-grade fever. After about two weeks, her diarrhea resolves. Others in the community are also affected. This is a case of cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium causes a watery diarrhea with associated crampy abdominal pain and low-grade fever. The incubation period typically is seven to 10 days. Note that patients may have large volume diarrhea. In healthy, immunocompetent patients, usually it's self-limited lasting about seven to 14 days, though it can be treated with antiparasitics if it becomes persistent. In immunocompromised patients, such as those with HIV, however, it can become severe and life-threatening or may become chronic. In cases of HIV, patients should be treated with HIV antiviral therapy to boost their immune system. Then if they have either severe or persistent symptoms, antiparasitics can be added as well. Cryptosporidium can be spread through contaminated food and water, from person to person, or like other zoonotic organisms, from animal contact. It often occurs in local outbreaks, classically in public swimming pools and municipal water supplies. But it can also occur in daycares and in dairy farms, as it can occur in cattle. Additionally, you may see it sporadically in travelers. Similarly to Giardia, it is common worldwide in resource limited areas and is one of the most common causes of infectious diarrhea in children and adults worldwide. Cryptosporidium is an intracellular protozoan parasite that infects the large and small bowel. In MOD, we primarily talked about Cryptosporidium parvum, but there are other Cryptosporidium species, including Cryptosporidium hominis, which cause infection in humans. In fact, taken together, Cryptosporidium parvum and hominis cause over 90% of all the infections by this organism. Similar to Giardia lamblia, the cyst form is very resistant and can survive chlorination. Once ingested, the cyst form gives rise to sporozoites, which are motile and have an organelle which attaches to the brush border. The sporozoite form is actually engulfed by the enterocytes and classically appears as small spheres adjacent to the enterocyte surface seen here. Notably, the oo cyst is acid fast, just like mycobacteria, and thus a distinguishing feature of this organism is the uptake of an acid fast stain. Here we see several acid fast oocysts. Now let's consider potential workup for Giardia and Cryptosporidium. First, you may consider Giardia in a patient with fatty or greasy stool or if they have exposure to drinking unfiltered water while camping or hiking, especially if they're having symptoms for more than a week. Testing for Giardia can be through the stool, ova, and parasite test as we did for Entamoeba histolytica. But additionally, there's also specific Giardia stool antigen tests, ELISA being an example. Additionally, like many of the pathogens we've covered, Giardia can be identified on stool PCR test. For Cryptosporidium, again, you may consider testing, especially if there's been known outbreaks in local water supplies or pools, and if the patient's having symptoms for more than a week. You may also consider if the patient continues to have unexplained diarrhea that's persistent, or in the cases of HIV. It's important to note that Cryptosporidium typically cannot be identified well on traditional stool ONP test and requires a specialized acid fast stain on the ONP to identify stool oocytes, just as Dr. Hillard indicated. Alternatively, you can test with a stool cryptosporidium antigen test through direct immunofluorescent antibody, or DFA, and again through the stool PCR test. Treatment for Giardia can include either metronidazole, remember we already discussed this previously as a treatment for Entamoeba histolytica, or with nidazoxanide, an antiparasitic drug. Cryptosporidium is treated with nidazoxanide. Let's talk about nidazoxanide, sold under the brand name Alenia. This compound is a broad-spectrum antiparasitic, a broad-spectrum antiviral that treats helminthic, protozoal, and viral infections. To include Cryptosporidium parvium, Giardia lamblia in immunocompetent individuals, this drug has been repurposed for the treatment of influenza.
It also treats infections caused by other protozoa and helminths. Note the structure in the center of this figure. This is a chemically diverse molecule that serves as a scaffold for the creation of many other compounds to include thiazolidine dions, which you'll learn about later as anti-diabetic drugs. But nitazoxanide is the prototypical member of the thiazolide family of compounds, all sharing this thiazolidine ring. Tizoxanide is an active metabolite of nitazoxanide. It's also an antiparasitic drug of the thiazolide class. Nitazoxanide was approved as a generic medication in this country in 2020. The structure of nitazoxanide is shown here, and its mechanism of action includes interference with pyruvate ferredoxin oxidoreductase, also known as PFOR. This enzyme participates in a key aspect of enzyme-dependent electron transfer, which is essential to the organism's anaerobic energy metabolism. You can see that here, where the PFOR enzyme is key for the conversion of glucose through pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Specifically, the PFOR enzyme catalyzes the oxidative decarboxylation of pyruvate, producing acetyl-CoA and CO2. Nitazoxanide is a first-line treatment for infection with blastocystis species to include Cryptosporidium parvum, Giardia lamblia in immunocompetent adults and children, as well as infections caused by other protozoa and helminths listed here. This drug is well tolerated and largely devoid of significant side effects. Just like we did for the cases of bloody diarrhea, we have diagrammed here the pathogens that cause non-bloody or watery diarrhea that we've discussed. While this is a great resource to study, please remember to reference the other slides for further details. Here we can see the top three are bacteria, enterotoxigenic E. coli, enteropathogenic E. coli, and Vibrio cholera. Remember these top two, the E. coli are both gram-negative rods, and Vibrio cholera is a gram-negative comma-shaped bacteria. We have our viruses here, rotavirus and norovirus. Recognize that there are many other viral causes of gastroenteritis or diarrhea astroviruses and adenoviruses being common ones. Lastly, our parasites, Giardia and Cryptosporidium, are here. Consider the clinical features, the transmission and epidemiology, and the pathologic features and complications that we have outlined here. Lastly, let's consider some pearls in the management of non-bloody or watery diarrhea. First, consider specific features that could point to underlying causes. Then remember that workup is indicated if you're having severe symptoms, if the stool has become bloody, persistent diarrhea, or high-risk patients. Remember fluid resuscitation, oral or IV, especially in cases of enteropathogenic E. coli, cholera, and rotavirus, all of which can cause severe dehydration. The stool, ova, and parasite may be considered if you're having persistent diarrhea and concerns about Giardia and Cryptosporidium. Remember, however, that Cryptosporidium requires an acid-fast stain on the ova and parasite. Also remember that both Giardia and Cryptosporidium have a stool antigen test available. Lastly, PCR or molecular test, which often is ordered as a GI pathogen PCR panel, can identify enterotoxigenic E. coli, enteropathogenic E. coli, cholera, rotavirus, norovirus, Giardia, and cryptosporidium, all of the causes that we've talked about for non-bloody or watery diarrhea.